Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. He is Sean Fitz. It's been a few days since we brought you a breakdown of the 2022 Penn State recruiting class. If you missed our last episode uh, coming to you on signing day night, go check that one out. Pretty long episode detailing position by position. We'll have a lot more to say about this class before several members enroll in January, but we already got to keep our focus on the 2023 group that just got a little bit bigger on a Monday morning as we were set to sit down and record. We pushed things back a little bit because we ain't being in the middle of a recording session when the commitment drops. So we planned ahead. Sean Fitz, uh, your reporting helped us do that. And Joshua Miller, who I know you were close to putting a crystal ball in a while back. That happened today. And then a commitment came swiftly afterward. We, we were talking about a crystal ball for Josh Miller back in, I think, September or October because um, he had set the stage for a potential decision. Uh, Penn State was has always been in the mix. Clemson was in the mix. North Carolina, I think Virginia Tech and Tennessee were his, his other two. Um, but I, I think this is a situation where he kind of tapped the brakes, and, and rightfully so. He's a 2023 prospect. Tapped the brakes with the uh, James Franklin rumors with USC, LSU, whoever else was in the mix at that point. I've kind of blocked that from my head. Um, but slowed things down probably as he should have as a 2022 prospect. But Always really liked Penn State. We thought he was going to commit to Penn State on November 2nd, um, which is the anniversary of his his, his late father's birthday. Uh, father passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, he, he decided to release that top five instead, wanted to take visits in the spring, but decided that this was the time for him to, to get it done. I think once there was a little bit more clarity on Penn State's uh, coaching situation, the stability there with the 10-year contract and things like that, Miller was able to hop on or ready to hop on board and was able to do so. Um, called up Penn State. They were happy to take his commitment. Now Penn State's got probably two or three offensive linemen in this class, depending on where you slot uh, Mega Barnwell, who's mm-hmm. tight end slash offensive lineman, because he's still got some development to do ahead of him. Miller listed six foot five, 320 pounds, uh, number 412 overall in the composite rankings, which lists him as the number 28 interior offensive lineman in the class. Uh, uh, 24-7 sports itself has met number 30 among all interior offensive linemen, a number eight player in Virginia. And of course, Penn State has the number one interior offensive lineman in our evaluation at 24-7 sports and Alex Birchmeyer, who committed uh, back during a really busy summer for Penn State. That was a big win for them in the 2023 cycle. And Miller had a lot of familiarity, and fortunately that's something we'll be talking about a lot with the 2023 recruiting class. These guys have actually get it, gone to campuses, gone to games, gone to camps. Fortunately, that will remain the case. This will be more of a cycle that gets us back to some semblance of normalcy, uh, especially as their upperclassmen. And that was big in this particular case because Miller, although he's you know down there in Virginia, uh, consistently making the trip up to Happy Valley, getting comfortable with campus and clearly comfortable enough uh, to make this decision halfway through his junior year of high school. He's had a relationship with Alex Birchmeyer for a long time. Birchmeyer actually, um, you know, wanted him to come up for the, the whiteout game. Unfortunately, Life Christian had a, a cancellation on their schedule, had to bump it back a day. He was not able to get to the whiteout game. But I'll say this about Josh Miller. He went to the Illinois game and he committed to Penn State. I mean, that's saying something because I know that that's uh, that was not for the the, the, the faint of heart there. Um, came back for the Michigan game, the stripe out game. He wanted to take in a big atmosphere at Penn State. Also went to games at Clemson and at North Carolina this fall. But, um, you know, as 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 long as we've been reading this one, it's it seemed like Penn State has been the team that's always been up there for him. He came to camp last summer for, with the big man challenge with Life Christian um, and has been back twice since. So that says something uh, popped in his tape this morning. Pleasantly surprised, better than I remember, um, because I don't think I watched his full senior tape. I I maybe watched some early stuff or something like that. This is a guy at 6'4 plus, probably close to 330. We list him at 320. Um, I expected him to be barreling guys over and falling on top of people, basically, is something that we've seen uh, a lot of offensive line prospects do in the past. But uh, really pleasantly surprised. Light feet for that size. Uh, was able to to lock onto people and get people moving. Um, and and I honestly think he's got a, a lot of his best football ahead of him. Life Christian has a ton of talent. They don't have a ton of success. So I'm wondering, you know, what his coaching is like at that level and how much he can benefit at the next level from a, a college weight program coach, things like that. So um, Penn State really likes them. I I am like I said, pleasantly surprised when I popped that tape in today because I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, So, you know, you've got another interior prospect. I know people are going to gripe about no true tackles, but for Birchmeyer and Miller, two of their top guys on the board in the interior in the 2023 class, um, it's a really good start for a group that should continue to add offensive linemen. 
and we're talking about since Phil Troutwine arrived, that, that initial recruiting class, the 21 class, you get one scholarship guy out of it by the end of the first year with, with Landon Tengwall, all that's remaining. You sign some players, but as you pointed out, Sean, in the 2022 cycle, um, still feels like an area where that was not maximized and a very good group overall offensive line there's some meat on the bone that was left in terms of what you want to do from a personnel standpoint it feels like it's going to force Penn State hand Penn State's hand to really be aggressive in the transfer portal which you should be anyways but particularly at that tackle position Phil Troutwine under a lot of heat here you mentioned maybe Barnwell ending up as an offensive lineman but at the very least here a couple of, of Virginia's top offensive linemen including their top ranked overall prospect in Birchmeyer um, what do you make of this start for the offensive line class? Because it feels like just about anything Troutwine is doing right now on the field, off the field, recruiting trail, people are going to be paying close attention to everything. No, I mean, people are going to criticize his his offensive line this year, rightfully so. But yeah, that's uh, it's one of those ones where you look at his past couple of cycles, especially last cycle is, you know, Penn State seemed to start out really high on people's lists, but eventually would fall off and and you know you end up no, no disrespect to the guys that sign but you end up with the guys uh, outside of drew shelton that you know have some development ahead and have you have question marks about so um starting off with birchmeyer huge um we'll, we'll put just put barnwell in a different category for now um but they yeah. they really like josh miller and and there's some you know there's there's a Good bit of tackles on the board. Samson Okunlola, um, whose brother just signed at Pitt last week. Uh, Chase Basantes, which you're going to have to do some work. Luke Montgomery. Javen Williams is the guy to look to here from Wyoming. Missing is a guy that Penn State's put a lot of work into um, in terms of, uh, you know, and just, just being there. But you, you, you look at the board and – it's one thing to have a bunch of names on there. It's another thing to have a bunch of names on there, but also have guys in the boat. And that's what they didn't have last year for the most part. Um, I look at Evan Link from Gonzaga down at Washington in, in Washington, DC. That's a guy I really like. And that's a guy that we probably don't, talk enough about in terms of he's been to campus he's been to big games and things like that and he's going to continue to pick up um he's going to continue to pick up offers and things like that um so we'll see how they can close on guys like that um but there's a difference between the the way that this uh you know this cycle went and the, and the past cycle because just because they have guys in the boat right now so those three players from Virginia, including Barnwell, uh, and then you got a couple, uh, a pair here from Pennsylvania, Lamont Payne, a defensive back, and, and Joey Schaeffler, a big tight end prospect. And so those are your five. And right now, Sean, only a couple programs, Notre Dame and Georgia, carry more commits in the 2023 cycle than does Penn State. Early on for the rankings, but we're always looking at these rankings. Number three in the nation right now for the 2023 cycle. Volume has something to do with that. But they also have three guys considered four-star prospects, or I should say a, a five-star prospect in Alex Birchmeyer when you look at the composite. So, um, you know, the goal here is try to pile on one set top 10 recruiting class with another. Uh, long way to go, but uh, pick up number five of that cycle so far. And it feels like a, a major opportunity here this offseason because you're going to have these winter visits. You're going to have some of these junior days, things that have been wiped off the face of the earth with the pandemic during recent recruiting cycles. Fingers crossed they're back in play right now. And Penn State's going to have they're going to be able to rely on a little bit of peer recruiting when these guys get together on campus because this is starting to be a, a bit of a, a sizable group where it's not just one, two, three guys standing around your facilities starts to be a bit of a huddle and that can start influencing visitors who are maybe a, a little unsure of, of the campus and a little unsure of the staff. These are the kind of guys when you have commits on board and you have them on campus, they can kind of ease that melt through some of that and, and make guys feel a lot more comfortable about moving forward with Penn state. Yeah. And I think they've already done that with Birchmeyer and, and now the Miller is going to be vocal. He's going to be one of those guys that's tweeting at everybody. Lamont Payne's doing the same thing. You know, that that's just the way it is in the 2023 cycle is, is yeah. all these guys are connected, even though they've, a lot of them haven't met each other. So um, we'll see how that continues to progress, but yeah, I think it's a, a solid start there and you want to continue to build on that certain positions. I think offensive line, um, you know, as we talked about with uh, at signing day last week, you're going to have to do a mix of high school kids and the portal. But given the way that you brought in one guy that's still with the program, as you mentioned, uh, in Landon Tangwall um, two cycles ago, and then this past cycle, two high school guys in Drew Shelton and Malik McNeil, you lost Andre Roy at the end. Um, you're going to have to lean on the portal. You're, and, and I think at some point you're going to have to have a class like you had in what was the 20 was that the 2020 cycle uh, where they, they brought in five guys. So our 29 or 2019 cycle, I think it was where they brought in five or six guys up front. Um, it, you know, buddy with the pandemic, I, I just can't 
keep up with uh, the number of guys in each class. So uh, I'll have to go back and, and get that in front of me. But uh, it's you're uh, talking offensive line. I think you're thinking uh, 2020 with Nick Dawkins and Golden that, Chumba. That was 2020. Non, wasn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Seems yeah, so yeah. much longer ago. Um, Jimmy Crest yeah, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, you, you got to go bulk at some point, I think. Um, and that's where they, you know, you you allocate certain numbers for certain positions at times. And I think you've come up short in uh, you've done what you can in terms of patching with transfers. Um, but you you have to develop those guys at some point. And, and and we'll see what that what that room looks like at the end of uh, the spring. But uh, that's uh, that's a direction I think you can go in this class. Of course, we'll have a lot to talk about with the 2023 cycle and, and the months and weeks and years ahead uh, when it comes to Penn State football. For now, uh, we're going to circle back to the 2022 class. And one of the marquee members of that group was Nick Singleton, the running back um, here in the state of Pennsylvania. Coveted commodity across the national recruiting trail. A big win for Penn State fighting off some other Power 5 programs, Notre Dame, Alabama, uh, among those involved in this pursuit. Singleton putting pen to paper on Wednesday. About 24 hours before that, we were lucky enough to get him on for a call right after he was named the Gatorade National Player of the Year. He got those honors uh, presented to him by Saquon Barkley. It was a surprise, virtual surprise at his school with Saquon Barkley, the former Penn State uh, running back, chiming in and saying, hey, guess what? You're the National Player of the Year. Really cool moment. We caught up with him right after work. Um, this was not something that we set up as a podcast interview, but we're sharing it with you. Uh, here is the conversation with Nick Singleton, who will be on campus and joining these Nittany Lions in just a matter of weeks. Hey, Nicholas, how are you? Congratulations. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, what a morning, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was a great morning. Yeah. <laughs> I know that you've been, you've been kind of talking to a lot of people and you're going to continue to talk to us, but I'm going to ask you what everybody else is. What was what was it all like, uh, and and how did exactly did you find out? I know Saquon Barkley was involved. Oh, yeah, him Saquon, I always looked up to him. Um, for him to tell me that I won National Player of the Year award, it felt great. I didn't know because I thought it would be just me celebrating the Player of the Year award for Pennsylvania, not national. For us, so for him to tell me that I won National National Player of the Year award, uh, it just felt good. Especially with my parents being there, my coaches, my um, teammates all cheering me on, so it just felt great. How did Saquon go about, you know, surprising you? And and what were what were the words that he shared with you? Yeah, he told me like, yo, like you know that you won national player, or I just shocked me. I was like, wait, hold on, what'd you say? Like for him to tell me that, it felt great, and he just told me I'm um, just to keep working. Um, this is just the beginning. Just good luck for me at Penn State. Uh, if I need anything, go just let me, just let him know. Nicholas, what what do you remember about uh, number twenty six in that Penn State uniform uh, when you were a younger guy, and um, what was that part of your early inspiration at the running back position? Um, just see him, um, because I watched him play against Michigan, how he ran that big run um, across the field. So for him, to, I'm just seeing him play. Um, he's obviously a good player. Uh, it just makes it a bit good impact for me picking Penn State because the running backs they produce, like him, Miles Sanders, Jeremy Brown, Noah Kane, like all them type of backs, and they're just really good. How big a part of that conversation was it with Coach Sider and with Coach Franklin and really everybody at Penn State about uh, the track record of Pennsylvania running backs who had chances to go elsewhere, went to Penn State, and it worked out well for them? They've been just telling me, like, all the running backs they produce, especially for in-state players, you know, Saquon, Miles, Journey, like they're in-state players. So for them to um, always stay home, um, make the running room like RBU, so it just feels good. As just trying to be in that place. You jumped up to number one in our running back rankings at 24-7 Sports uh, this season. You put together a fantastic senior year. What was different about you as a senior in 2021 versus what we saw earlier in your high school career? Uh, I'll probably say uh, a little bit of my speed. Um, more They want to see more explosion. You saw them more explosion. I'm really going through people because I usually just run around people because it's just my speed. But if I had to, I would just literally, you probably see more different. Like I would just go through people, chucking people. I'm somewhere catching a little bit, so that's probably it. What did your presence on the field do for your team? I have to imagine you drew a, a, a big crowd on the defensive uh, side of the football. It didn't really matter, though. You still put up the numbers, but what did it do for the rest of the offense, and, and how much attention did you actually receive on a weekly basis? Um, Yeah, because everybody know how, obviously, how good I am, Um, so they basically keep playing on me um, to stop me, um, especially we have a lot of good players like Eden, Johnson, Trey Rock, um, Aiden Gallon that can just run the, rock, run the ball. Just to spread up, spread the ball a little bit, just so they can, you know, stop the other players too. Besides me, so it takes it takes um, the tension off them. But then when they start noticing what they're what we're doing, it takes the tension off of me, so they can just we can rotate anything. It's not just giving me the ball. You know what I mean? I know. I know Penn State didn't run the ball as well as they wanted to this year. Coach Sider has said that a few times. What 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 makes you uh, excited, optimistic about a bounce back year for for the running game in 2022? Um, he's just been telling me, um, come work, um, come um, take this spot because he knows 
Um, I have a lot of speed. Um, the running backs are good, but he's saying, like, the speed's a little bit not there. You know what I mean? So he's been telling me uh, just to keep working. I'll get this playbook down. Um, I can – play a little bit early where are you expecting uh your 40 yard dash to be in range wise uh, w- when you get on campus for that first testing probably like in the four fours i'm hoping i believe so and katron allen is coming in uh, as well as another talented running back do you two have any kind of a relationship yet and and when you watch his game what stands out to you we have it um i met him at the um the auburn whiteout game but we haven't really talked because we had it during the season so he took his time with the team i took myself to the team but I see him, he's just really, he'd be bulldozing people. Got a little bit of good speed. Um, I just been seeing him just really chugging people, scoring. Um, he's obviously a great player. So me and him in the, on the backfield, it's going to be really good. And then what do you think about the competition in that backfield? Uh, you mentioned Noah. They're, they're, he's just one of the several guys who it looks like are going to be back and competing. Mm-hmm. What uh, what stands out to you about that room? Um, it's a great room. Um, I have a good relationship with all the players. Um, they're really helpful for me, um, Tell me. To do when I get up here, um, I know they'll be helping me get the classes, um, push me in the weight room, especially um, helping me with the playbook. It'll be really competitive, but I'm really up to it. What did you think about getting Sean Clifford uh, back for another year, playing a sixth year, being this, the four, a fourth year starter? Looks like uh, in 2022. What was your reaction to the news? Um, yeah, him, like he's obviously a good player. Um, getting him back, um, it's good because literally he can literally do it all. Um, he's he knows the playbook more. I mean, he's be I'd be probably looking up to him more. Um, him help me with stuff. So for him to come back would be good. And we had uh, Drew uh, on for a conversation last week, and he had a lot of good things to say about you, Drew Aller. Mm-hmm. What do you, what would you like to say about Drew and, and number one quarterback in all rankings? You're the number one running back. What what could that pair do at Penn State? Um, yeah, we've been hearing their social media. Um, he's obviously a great, great, great quarterback. Um, he can do anything, run it, throw the rock. Um, so for him to be out there, um, going to Penn State, uh, it'll be a great deal in a couple of years. We'll be looking forward to it. And I do have to ask about fellow Pennsylvania guy here, Bo Prabula, because because I know he was recruiting you hard. What does it say about his character? I mean, everyone's focused on Drew, and he's going to be there. He's going to be competing yeah. in a month. What do you think about Bo as a, as a competitor and as a, a potential quarterback for Penn State? Um, yeah, Bo's good. Um, I see him playing at Central New York. I saw a little bit um, when he had um, the links to the games. I see him, he just throws the ball like it's literally nothing. Be right on the spot. So for him – to be part of the Penn State family, too, will be good because Drew and him will always compete. Um, Pussy Cheddar will make the team better, so I'm looking forward to it. And my last question for you, Nick, thanks again for the time. Um, when, when you look ahead with your class here, getting to campus, making an impact, what, what's your message to Penn State fans out there who are wondering what's this class all about? What do you think this class is all about? Um, this class is going to be really good in a couple of years, um, especially next year, too, because we'll have a lot of players that are coming in, stepping up big time. So a couple of years, especially, um, just wait for us. We'll be going for a Pig Ten championship, especially for a national championship, too. Hey, well, congratulations again on the Player of the Year honor. Have a great time with your signing day ceremony, and we'll see you on campus real soon, okay? All right, thank you. Thanks again to Nick, and also thanks to the good folks at Gatorade for helping us set that one up. We weren't even aware that was going to be a possibility until very shortly before you heard that interview. So, um, Sean, obviously everyone around here is excited to see Nick Singleton uh, come on board. You got Katron Allen, been a lot of talk about that. When we go back to Bull Media Day, though, it's about some of the guys who are leaving, and that's kind of where the conversation is. It is an open-ended conversation right now, less than two weeks away from the bowl game. But we know that linebacker Brandon Smith, a uh, year three player with Penn State, uh, eligibility on the table for 2022 and 2023. He's done in an Indy Lions uniform. He's not going to be playing in the Outback Bowl. He's going to be preparing for the 2022 NFL Draft. A couple of years as a starter with the Indy Lions, uh, two different linebacker positions, a guy that we were hoping we may be able to see his trajectory move forward here at Penn State. He is a mystery to me. I mean, even if he goes out there and athletically piles up impressive numbers, and I, and I assume he will, uh, you turn on the game tape, and, and there's a pretty significant amount of that now in his Penn State career. I think there's some questions about whether this was the right time, and good for him and good for his family if this was the good move for them. But I have to say I'm a bit surprised uh, considering how the season went for Brandon Smith. We did not see him ascend as like that all Big Ten kind of talent as the game record that Penn State really needed. But maybe we would have seen it next year. And as we've seen, some guys move on to the NFL and they just keep moving forward and they play a little bit better even then then they continue to blossom. Uh, But that will not happen here in State College. Yeah, unfortunately for Penn State fans, I think it's going to be the case. I think Brandon Smith's going to be a better pro than he was college mm-hmm. player, and um, we we just never saw him take that next step. And it's it's frustrating to watch, uh, you know, from a fundamental standpoint in terms of 
squaring up and, and do, you know, just, just, just breaking down those things. Um, I think with his size, that'll translate better to the next level with his athleticism. He'll be able to be there. I'll be interested to see if somebody uses him as an edge rusher. Um, there were several schools that recruited him as a defensive end originally. That's one of the reasons, you know, he really liked Penn state because they let him stick at linebacker. Um, but yeah, that's just the production never matched the potential. And that's really unfortunate to say. And, and, and I say that as a fan of Brendan Smith, I think he's probably, somewhere in between where Penn state fans view him and, and where he was on the, on the game film. I think he was, uh, or, or where he, where, where these, um, I, I, let me re rephrase that. He's somewhere between where Penn state fans see him and NFL scouts are going to see him. So, um, unfortunate that it never really, um, took that next step, just all the physical talent in the world. Just, uh, it was, it was unfortunate, uh, to, to not see the fundamentals come through and really be the player that we thought he could be coming into to the process. So uh, I, I say say the same thing I said about away next or last year. He's going to go higher than you think he should, and he's probably going to be better than you think he should. But uh, you know, all the best to Brandon. He's always been good good to us, no doubt. I agree with you. The the, the thing that that wraps you know, hard to wrap your head around with Brandon Smith. You know the way he came in as a number one rated linebacker in the country by twenty four seven Sports, and a guy that you look at played a ton of games, started a bunch of games for Penn State. Hard to find those memorable moments from the when they say, "Hey, what what are the moments you remember from Brandon Smith's career?" I'm like I remember when he sent C.J. Thorpe to his knees and it went viral, and that was an awesome hit as as a as a freshman. Um, but you think about his time as a starter, uh, there were a lot of plays, uh, you know, chasing guys downfield. We talked about it, some pinball moments that were really poorly timed, where just not wrapping up, and all of a sudden the guy's getting downfield and it's back breaking gains, but. You know, very clearly there were some splash plays made by Brandon Smith over the course you know, of Big Ten football, but it just I can't really conjure up the the highlight reel in my head. And when you ask me to do that for other guys who have come through here, um, like a Micah Parsons, who we've seen, and you just think I think Micah Parsons and the more we see of some of these linebackers at Penn State, I mean we're seeing at the NFL level how spoiled were we see he's seen the infantile stages of what Micah Parsons was as a linebacker here at Penn State because we've seen Brandon Smith come through. We saw Lance Dixon roll through as a five-star prospect. Curtis Jacobs came in as a five-star prospect, and you hope there's growth for him going in to his third year. But it ain't easy to go from five-star prospect to game record on a Big Ten defense. Maybe Micah made it look easy, but no one has able been really be able to come in and, and, and make it such a seamless transition. And I guess it may not matter to NFL scouts. They just want to pick you up on the upswing. That's what matters to them. Uh but I think ultimately it's going to hurt Brandon Smith, whereas if he had delivered this year and been that kind of a game wrecker, we're probably talking about a first round level talent here at linebacker. Um, I'm going to be really curious on how NFL scouts, how the folks who uh, you know parse through this all between now and April marry the game film and the body of, of physical talent and the specimen that is Brandon Smith and the guy that's going to be, you know, do just fine in meetings. He's really impressive young man to sit down and speak with comes from a great family, but how does that all marry up with what we saw from him as two years of a starter at Penn state? He feels like a little bit, uh, certainly left on the table here in his Nittany Lions career, but that's not the first time this has happened where a guy has come in to Penn state left earlier than people thought. And to your point, gone on and, and continued improving at the next level but Brandon Smith's got his work cut out for him. And I think in terms of benefit of the doubt, a lot of people here in Happy Valley are not going to be quick to give it to him when projecting him as a professional player. Well, the, the expectations certainly uh, change the perception of players. And there's the, you know, the the perception that he did not maximize his talent while at Penn State is something that it's not just a Brandon, it's just not just a Brandon Smith thing. We saw it last year with the way we've even seen it with Parsons that people are, are salty about the way that his career went, that he never, you know, uh, topped out or anything like that. So I, I think it's just natural. And it's, it's not just a Penn State thing either. This is something across the country. Those guys that stick it out and play and, and use all their eligibility and do everything, even if they're not at the level um, of the guys that leave early, have a different place in people's heart than the guys that seemingly skip out. I mean, there's still people, you know, talking about Jesse James leaving a year early. You know, that's that that's kind of just how things go in college football fandom. But yeah, I agree with you. I think that the the expectation of him coming in as a five star. I don't think, you know, and this is not something new for Penn State in the last uh, decade or so, hasn't lived up to that. But I do think that he'll be a guy that NFL scouts look at. It, it, it's funny, and I say this all the time, football people love Brandon Smith. 
football people love um, guys like that and think and NFL coaches and coaching staffs think that they're the people that that this player needs to develop into the best form of themselves. And I think you're going to see that a lot with Brandon Smith. There's going to be a ton of interest in terms of a guy that's nearly 6'5", uh, that moves like he does, can finish plays like he does. It's just a matter of, of this was a guy that did not finish enough plays at Penn State. We wish Brandon well on on what comes next for him. We're focused, though, on the Outback Bowl, and we're not sure what else is going to happen between now and kickoff because the name that we've all been fixated on is Jahan Dotson, of course, and you talk about a projectable first-round talent out of Penn State this year. Jahan Dotson is the name at the forefront. Jaquan Brisker, probably the next man up in terms of an NFL prospect. And and those are the two that we've talked about a lot. But Brandon Smith has been discussed for a while about a potential opt-out scenario. Um, Sean, you were at practice. I am, if if people are watching on YouTube, I'm at my my family's house in New Jersey this week. And then we're moving up to my in-laws in Connecticut. We're all over the place. But you were there on the ground. And it was uh, light on the numbers. And, and, you know, reading between the lines with a bowl ahead and opt-outs happening all across the country. This may be a bit of a skeleton crew and certainly a young crew that takes on the Razorbacks uh, in just about, what, nine, 12 days? Trying to do math here in a lifetime. Yeah, you were not uh, you were you were not the only familiar face that was not present in Haluba the other day. Uh, it was a, a skeleton crew, as you would say. I mean, just some big time names not there, and it's not surprising in bowl season. That's kind of the way that this has gone, um, and and that's an argument for another actually another podcast because we don't really need to do that. Um, but no, Jahan Dotson, no Jaquan Brisker, Arnold Ebikiti, um, a couple of Ellis Brooks. I mean, there's there's a, a number of guys not on hand. Uh, on Friday at practice, uh, waiting for those official announcements from some of those guys, but you know, guys, some guys that we already know are not going to play. Um, but it, it's it, it's disappointing, but at the same time, there's there's opportunity in in that, and that's something we tried to focus on in terms of our notes the other day. How do you go in and and say uh, you know no Jahan Dotson, but you've got Parker Washington, you've got Keandre Lambert Smith, who's going to step up behind him? Are you going to see more twelve personnel with Brenton Strange and Theo Johnson and and Tyler Warren as well? Which I probably think that's the way Penn State has to go. Uh, no Rashid Walker, so Olu Fashanu maybe getting his shot at left tackle. So. There's 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 so much opportunity there, and if you look at this bowl trip, um, it's more uh, and and you have it written down here in the in the lineup, and I didn't even see it until now. Um, but it's more <laughs> about jumping into 2022 than it is closing out 2021, and that's unfortunate because if you lose this game to Arkansas, which also has a couple of opt outs um, on their end as well, probably won't have as many. Um, but uh, it's it's about finishing but but giving yourself that launch pen into 2022 and you know you're probably going to see some younger players because of it Traylon Burks the, the the big one that's out on Arkansas and he announced really early on after this matchup uh went public and and of course him Dotson viewed as two of the premier prospects at, at their position in the upcoming NFL draft haven't heard anything official that could change by the time you even listen to this podcast on anyone except for Brandon Smith but uh we're ready and and we're and we're gonna scramble and and we'll be ready to adjust our expectations for the matchup but the conversation of course becomes you know is this trying to punctuate your 2021 on a high note or is it, hey, what can we do for that 2022 mission, um, you know, as you just alluded to, Sean? And, and yeah, it makes you wonder here over the next week and a half of practice, what they're doing right now in Happy Valley this week, what they're going to do next week down in, on the west coast of Florida. How much is it about positioning yourself to take off for launch in spring ball versus trying to get to that eighth win? And, and let's face it, I don't know what Arkansas is going to look like with Traylon Brooks. Let's start there. He was felt like 80 percent of their offensive attack when you go through the numbers. I know they got the ground game, but. They're in scramble mode, too. And you just hear reading between the lines and, and and talking to some of these people involved in the decisions. Penn State's not even sure what kind of hand they're going to be playing with quite yet in the game. And when you're talking about shuffling some things from a staff perspective, you've been recruiting all these in-home visits. You've been searching for a defensive coordinator. A little bit of a reminder that the bowl game is on the back burner until maybe a week and a half before the bowl game. Yeah, that's kind of how they treat these things. And and it's funny because you were talking or we were talking to players and a couple of them were asked, would you rather have a month to prepare for somebody or just a week like in a game? And a lot of them were like, 
to be honest with you, that's a lot to think about in a month. So you you can jam it into a week and and that works too. Um, we'll see what, what happens from a coaching point of view. Of course, Manny Diaz hired earlier this month, but he's just going to be basically an observer. And that's the way it is for most uh, guys that get hired at, in coordinator spots. Anthony Poindexter is going to call the defense. Joe Lorig is going to coach the linebackers. So you won't miss a ton. Joe Lorig, of course, the outside linebackers coach has worked with them all year. So even without Brent Pry there, who who's you know spearheaded the drills throughout the season you still have a familiarity with Lorig, and they're going to need it because they're going to they're going to miss a couple of linebackers there so um we'll, we'll see what happens with that but uh yeah it's about uh, getting your guys going for 2022 i would think you've got uh um you know if brisker's not there you've got to keep nellis back there maybe jalen reed playing some um trying to figure out where they can you know just uh, get the most out of their experience without really exposing these guys and and ma- putting them in a bad position. Um, you know, I, I don't see how they're going to get around it at some of those spots. Defensive end still going to be really thin. If you don't have a um, you've got Smith Vilbert starting, which is no, no disrespect there, but it's a, that's a long drop off right there from, from a to Smith Vilbert. Um, you know, you move around Ellis Brooks. That means you're moving around Jesse Lucetta. Uh, it's just so many moving parts here and it's tough to, you know, for guys like Lucetta, the seniors that are on their way out. Um, it's tough to um, sort of, I don't want to say mail it in for them to, to, put yourself in a position to work those young guys through there. But at the same time, I think they understand the situation as well. And by the way, Luketa, someone that, that I was able to catch up with a bit on the virtual bowl media day Friday is in for the bowl game. And, and as Sean just referenced, uh, not, not one of those names missing from practice. Um, 2022 non-committal right now, that decision will come after the bowl game. Um, and then you were on the call with Jair Brown, who you know just saw his teammate kind of have to, to make a decision last winter Paid off in a big way. Had an All-American uh, campaign to Jaquan Brisker. And Jair Brown, man, what a boost he would be if he decides to follow the same path as Brisker. Yeah, and I, I think we've been saying this for a while. We, I expect Jair Brown back. Um, but it's a it's a matter of making a decision. And, and to be honest with you, I mean, Poindexter was on the fence there about Virginia. And, you know, you you had potential changes for his position coach. you got a new defensive coordinator. So you got to feel those out and you kind of owe it to yourself to take as much time as you need. Um, but I expect uh, Brown to be back in that secondary and they're going to need him. And I think he can really benefit from it as well. Talk to him a little bit about what Brisker went through in the last year, where Brisker went from a mid a mid round guy, potentially a second round guy right now. Um, so you you've that's a big jump and that's a that's a lot of dollar signs in front of you uh, to, to, to make that jump from the fourth or fifth round to the second round. So I think he can make a jump. I don't think he can, I don't think he's going to wow NFL scouts as much as Brisker did, even though he did have the takeaway numbers. Um, I think Brisker is the, the, the better all around athlete. He's got the better size and things to work with there. Um, but he can still really benefit from coming back to school for another year. And I think, I think he'll end up doing that. In an offensive tackle, though, Rashid Walker has kind of been out of the lineup here for what feels like a while, missing the last few games of the season. But Olu Fashano was also out of sight, out of mind, not in the practice field when we saw them, not out in uniform for some of those games toward the tail end of the regular season. So you talked about him maybe being involved. How much does Bryce Effner factor in? We, we saw him at tackle quite a bit in, in, late in the regular season. And then Landon Tengwall, things began to open up for him the last two games. Mike Miranda, Juice Scruggs, you've got one, you know, you're expecting back next year. Is he your center next year, Juice Scruggs? How does this all play into what Phil Troutwine does in finding the five that he rolls out there with the first team unit? Maybe some of the other guys he may work in against Arkansas, which, um, uh, you know, there's, that's that's to me one of the more fascinating things because if there's any offensive line, if there's any position that needs a strong finish slash momentum carried into 2022, it's that offensive front. So I want to see how they mix match uh, some of the younger guys. And if you can find some young emerging tackles here in the next few weeks and, and, and solidify maybe some depth there in 2022, that to me is, is up there with just about as much as you want to accomplish from a personnel standpoint for Penn State. And uh, reinforcements need to come in the offseason, but really got to figure out what you have on this roster, where they can play football that's going to maximize their skill set. Yeah, I mean – the offensive line and, and we've gotten, you know, uh, far enough away from the season where you kind of get a little bit of hope up and think that you maybe could run for, you know, have more success on the ground or whatever. They were so bad that it's just, it's tough to have any uh, optimism about that. So you're trying to figure out how many band-aids you could put on that just to get you to that finish line so you can get a fresh start in spring ball. Um, so we saw Scruggs at center. So maybe that's, that's a little bit of both in terms of getting your best five out there, 
but at the same time, setting yourself up for the future. Fashanu, I talked about before. So I don't know how it's going to work. Um, they got to just get across the finish line as an offensive line and try and fresh start or start fresh in the spring. I do think Tangwall can be a guy that that can come in and help them. Um, you know, Anthony Wigan was, I thought, serviceable at the end of the season when those guys were sick. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully for their sake, um, the experience and the the mixing and matching they did at the end of the season can benefit them in the future because the expectations are are pretty well close to zero right now for the offensive line. So you just don't want to go, you don't want to dip below that if you're Penn State. And, and by the way, um, offensively, we did hear from Mike Yersich, very candid conversation. Uh, I think Mark Brennan has a story up on Lions 24-7 about that one. But speaking on Bull Media Day, which was the first time we got Yersich uh, since late September, I think it was, uh, put he took complete ownership of this. If people were looking for, for uh, some ownership here about how the offense went in year one, uh, yeah, he took that on. He also said he planned on uh, the uh, getting better or he would die trying, um, which is something we heard Jim Harbaugh, Harbaugh say. Isn't it? Yeah. Worked out well for Harbaugh. I mean, we heard it in July in Chicago, and all of a sudden he was in the Big Ten title. But the quote here, um, not good enough, a lot of room to improve. We didn't execute at the level that we needed to execute at. I take the blame. It solely falls on my shoulders. We'll get better. I'll get better. No one thrown under the bus there by Mike Yersich. And, and by the way, uh, really interesting the way he talked about bringing uh, having Sean Clifford back on board. He said he didn't want to have to sell Sean. He didn't want to have to recruit Sean. He wanted Sean to want to be in the room and want to help coach up these young quarterbacks. And they crossed that all off their list during conversations. And it sounds like they've got a really good plan ahead. So we talked about the health of the quarterback room looking good. Mike Yersich, uh, Sean Clifford remain at the crux of that for another year, but uh, a lot in place right now where they are building toward the future. And Yersich knows he needs a rebound season if Penn State is going to bounce back. And, we, and we'd prefer him not to die. I know we don't even like firing no. guys on this podcast, so we're not <laughs> trying to kill Mike Yersich. But yeah, um, good to see him take the, uh, take the responsibility for it. Now it's about changing it, and there's really not much you can say beyond that. Uh, let's get to our five-star mailbag to wrap up this episode of the Lions 24-7 podcast. And it takes us back to this signing class. So many of Penn State's 2020, 2022 signees committed in a short span during the summer, and it was difficult to keep track with one after the other. Do you think anyone who came on from that time was maybe overlooked as a result? And shall we can confirm this? It felt like every single day in July, it was either we were writing and, and talking about a commitment or we were preparing to do it the next day. Yeah, I think by the time they got to the end of July, um, there was so much commitment fatigue. And that, you know, that's a real thing because people were, I don't want to say clicking on things less, but, you know, they'd just be like, oh, great. Another another guy is, in the, is on board. Um, it, it was so active. I've never seen anything like it. Um, but that's kind of how we drew it up. And it's exactly how it came to fruition. But so by the time they got to, I think it was the 31st Lash Bash weekend, you got commitments on the same day from KJ Winston. And then I think later that night was Abdul Carter. Um, and probably did not receive the fanfare that they should have, just in terms of these guys are really, really good. I mean, these guys, top half of the class, maybe the, the, the rankings don't say it, but top half of the class in terms of potential. Um, so I think those two, and, and I've, I've harped on KJ Winston every chance I've gotten throughout this cycle since probably since the winter last year. Um, just a really good player. And then Carter. Um, you know, has some work to do in terms of uh, learning to to play the game, but in terms of physical freaks and guys that could really um, turn that physical prowess into uh, a, a, a really productive career, whether it be an edge rusher, whether it be a big linebacker, um, those two guys, I think you're going to look back um, in a couple of years and say that these guys, that was a big day for Penn State football. I'm, I'm going to go back to the 4th of July because not only did you have your family and fireworks to contend with, but you had a couple other commitments. You remember the, the short-lived commitment of Tyrese Fearbury uh, out of Pittsburgh. Um, that was part of the 4th of July hoopla. But Zane Durant came on board on the 4th of July, Sean. And to me, every time you, you turn the tape on with this kid, you, you hear about him from people. Cooper, uh, was it uh, Andrew Ivins uh, just about a week and a half ago on this podcast down in Florida has had a long look at Zane Durant discussing what he has seen from him. And then you just look at the production from recent years. I love that he gets involved on offense, playing a little bit of running back down there. But he is in the backfield on defense so much. 28 tackles for loss, 15 sacks as a senior. And I see maybe some Kevin Givens here. Uh, I think he has more of a an, uh, probably a higher athletic and prospect profile. 
But coming into Penn State, uh, where does he fit on the defensive front? Can he do a few things for you? Is it going to be on the edge early and inside later? Um, are you going to need him to do a little bit of both? Because that's what depth requires over the course of his career. I think him coming in early to me really is, it makes Zane Duran a guy. I'm circling not just is he overlooked for, for who came in, but you know, who's going to be able to come in as a freshman? Tall task for any freshman defensive defensive tackle. We've seen a lot of defensive tackles not surf until year three or four at Penn State. But I really like what Zane Durant's bringing to that room. And, and I'm not going to count him out to come in and, and, and maybe contend for a little action as autumn goes on in 2022. Yeah, I mean, I, I think with Zane Durant, the question is, how big is he going to come in? I mean, he's anywhere from 230 to 250, as you would, right. would say, that, which is, you know, a little bit undersized for a defensive tackle. I don't mind it at all because you've got, um, you know, you've got a situation where he can build them himself up in the right way, keep that twitch and, and keep going with that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that's the question is, is, is he going to be big enough or are you going to use him as a, the five tech as they did with Kevin Givens, play him and end a little bit. And if, if you do that, is he ready to do that? I'm not sure that he's, he's quite there yet, but uh, yeah, it was just an impressive um, you know, an impressive month because you, you know, you, you, you don't even think about, uh, or for, besides the guys that they got, they kept a bunch after those official visits. You remember Drew Shelton was visiting other spots this year. Um, you know, probably another guy you could add to this mix is Keon Wiley, who, you know, kind of gets, uh, gets forgotten here and there. Uh, but yeah, what a month Cam Miller, you could throw in there. Just, uh, <laughs> just, I'm Al, going that's what Al Birchmeyer committed, by the way, the, the number one offensive lineman in 24 sevens rankings, uh, you know, he, he got snuck into the 2023 class midway through July as well. So it was quite, quite the, uh, quite the few weeks there, man. Yeah, it was exhausting. And it was, it was great for Penn state because you, you come off of the not being able to host anybody. And all of a sudden, you know, we talked for so long about the, the potential for, you know, late June into early July. And then July is just a, you ride a commitment wave, just wondering who's going to be next. And that, it's fun. I mean, it's, it's no doubt about it. It's fun, especially if you're a fan following the stuff, but uh, yeah, it was something Penn state really definitely could have used going into the season to get themselves back onto that, uh, uh, back onto that national spotlight. And you remember they had the number one class in the country at that point. So it was, uh, it was a pretty cool time, but I can definitely see some of these guys and um, you know, you go down the commitment list and, and, it, and it's tough to, uh, to remember three commitments in a day or two commitments in a day. Um, but uh, yeah, I think they're going to get some real players out of that month. Solid question, one that clearly resonated with us from the five-star mailbag. Throw yours in up at Apple Podcast. We look forward to getting to those as, as the offseason commences. A lot happening right now at Lions247.com. The transfer portal is in full rotation. Coaching carousel could still continue to impact this Penn State staff. And, of course, the 2023 recruiting class now front and center with his commitment from Joshua Miller. Um, Sean, you and I starting to peer a little bit ahead uh, at the weather forecast for Tampa, Florida. Uh, we will have any news that comes up between now and next week on the Outback Bowl. Um, I haven't. Sean, I actually haven't. I haven't looked yet. Oh, you're resisting. I, I, I've done that in the past, and it's just been nothing but a letdown. So I'm I'm holding off on that. I, I, it's nice enough. I've, I've got Clearwater Beach in my in my phone year round. So it's it, I'm just going to hold off on that for now. Yeah. So again, we're not sure exactly what kind of team Penn State is bringing down, but as things break and give us some clarity on that, lines247.com is going to be your destination. Go check it out. 24-7 for Lance Glenn, for uh, our producer, for co-host Sean Fitz. I'm Tyler Donahue coming to you from New Jersey this time around. We're back with another episode later in this week. Talk to you real soon on the Lions 24-7 podcast.